um, from the whole panel's point of view. I mean, there's going to be probably a few questions here that we have from the earlier registration forms, and I'll just kind of seed a few here. We're going to actually be um, a little bit over time, so if you all want to stay on, we'll hopefully be able to keep everybody for probably a few extra minutes over the hour, if that's possible, but I'll start off some of the questioning, and I'll bring back up Karen uh, from earlier. So, Karen, in, in terms of your experience, um, you've probably seen and developed a point of view with design with accessibility in mind or universal design uh, when it comes to urban parks and rec areas. Um, I think it's, it's very important, especially when it comes to any sort of underrepresented community to understand and empathize with that community properly and hoping that you can share some of the first things that you see that help you evaluate if a space is actually accessible and in this, in this case, environmentally successful um, and hoping that that helps us all kind of take a look at, through another person's view. Um, do you have any tips or pointers that like what you see? I mean, you've mentioned a few, especially with like some of the paved areas and, and ramping, but is there any other things that you always take note of? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question, Gino. And I think um, I want to preface my answer with this. I, um, my personal and my professional lens is always based on equity. However, my lenses of equity are limited. I am a privileged white disabled woman. And so what I also believe very strongly in is collective liberation and all decisions with respect to design is based upon the community's involvement as a priority and that needs to be resourced. So when I'm looking at specific areas or I'm asked to be involved in something, that is what I bring forward at the, ve the very first conversation. I want whoever I'm working with to understand and know that I'm not gonna step into the space with you unless this organization or this company recognizes that A, disabled people are not a monolith, that we are so incredibly diverse, just like non-disabled people, and our perspectives are so different. I cannot, and I will never speak on behalf of a black blind person. Like that is just not what's gonna happen here. So uh, in the spirit of my answer, uh, I work on multiple projects, um, specifically um, inclusive walk audits. Um, I'm working right now with Dr. Meg Tracy out of the University of Montana, and also virtual, movable, and walkable areas. And so what we do and what we elevate is a diverse population and in inclusivity when we're doing these very specific audits. So when we show up in a space, because it is my dream to not be the only one. I don't, know, I don't want to be the only one. We shouldn't be the only one in the room speaking on behalf of. It is so limited with respect to equity. It is, and it's not fair. And um, so that being said, like these are very specific organizations that we at the National Center on Health, Physical Activity and Disability work with and in collaboration with, and we create convener groups. So getting the data from the diverse population is really important. I can give an opinion. I'm like, oh, that doorway is not wide or, oh, we're going to have to work on that sidewalk issue over there. And I can do a very linear assessment you know, but that may only be from my wheelchair using perspective. And I will always bring that forward because that is extraordinarily limited and it will not be sustainable for the long term. And um, also working with the uh, NACDD, which is the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, specifically the project lead is uh, Karma Harris. And also again, with a really distinguished faculty um, with respect to all of these equity issues. Uh, Charles Brown is part of that out of Rutgers, um, and, and he brings forward just micro mobility issues, expertise in equity and transportation. So again, the diversity of the perspectives. And also, lastly, disability is so often siloed. It's like you have our people of color community, indigenous populations, Latinx, LGBTQIA+, and then you have disabled people. What I want people to understand is that we belong in all of the groups because disability is an intersectional identifier within the scope of all humanity. So that's my short answer. <laughs> I love it. There you go. 
<laughs> I love it. No, because it's completely representative of, you know, people when, when we, we bucket, I want to say categorize, right? People in specific affinities specifically, right? There's a sense of onlyness that tends to happen where you have to be the token or the representative of that specific group. And there's this obligation, but at the same time, like this is reality of exactly what you're explaining where, you know, we are only representative of our own point of view. I can only represent myself as a Filipino American gay man in any sort of conversation. I can't speak on behalf of others. And I think you just drove that point home that I was hoping you would get yeah. to. So thank you so much for that answer. I think, you know, Gino, just to add to that, I think it's really important for those of us with disabilities, again, who have the privilege to be in these lanes, is to egocentrically recognize to move out of the lane. You know, that is so important. Like, get out of the lane. Here you go. Like, we have to bring forward diverse perspectives. That's just, the, that's the way the solution's gonna occur. Love it. I love it. Uh, Luke, I'm going to move to a question for you. So there's this concept of intent versus impact that, that I see a lot of when it comes to discussing diversity and inclusion um, and a lot of the topics that I deal with. And um, people's intent may not match the impact that actually happens, but with what you kind of discussed in regards to the redlining and the districting and the urban candidate, it looked like, you know, the intent kind of match the impact of like what happens when you segregate communities in such a way. And with the election coming up and knowing that there's a lot of ballot initiatives going out there for a lot of us around the country to vote on, um, and from your point of view at least, when it comes to tips and pointers regarding questions we should be thinking about when it comes to voting pro-urban canopy and making sure that that impact is long lasting, is there anything that you see from that public sphere that you're in of we should be aware or we should make sure we're questioning ourselves when we're saying, I'm going to vote for this or vote for that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the thing that sort of sticks out for me when you ask that question, Gino, is that Luke, I don't you're know- You're kind of quiet know. again, Luke. Sorry, sorry. All right. Is that better? Okay. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit on my microphone here and hopefully everyone can hear me okay. But the thing, that, the thing that sticks out for me is I don't know that the urban canopy was ever intentional. And what I mean by that is while I think people value trees in and of themselves, the thought of the urban canopy as a thing, as like what's our regional urban canopy is not something that policymakers necessarily sort of construct in their minds, right? It's sort of like we can, we can evaluate what it is, we can see what it is, but there's not like a, you know, even today, you know, LA now has a, a, a forestry director, a manager who just got hired last year, who's sort of doing an assessment of where, you know, trees exist and they don't. Um, but, but even with that, it's still sort of looking at like individual trees here and there. And it's not, there's not sort of a thought around what, it, what, are the, what is the effect of years and years of policies being one thing, putting us where we are today, and how that how that, potent, that could potentially sort of persist without very intentional, in, intentional work. And so like for me, that's why, why my key sort of recommendation in all this is to be intentional, is to look at not just trees for the sake of trees, although I do think that is important, but to look at trees as a tool to redress historic wrongs and to be intentional in that work. Um, because we were kind of, I think, sort of unintentional in how that sort of played out for many, many decades, for better or worse, I would say largely for worse. Um, and where we are today, then, the, in order to really sort of move the needle in a good direction, we need to have to, be, we have to be much more intentional about it. Intentionality is the key. I get it. I love it. Um, I have a question for you, Robin, here from Dr. Shetty in the UK. Let me move up here to get that. So are people from the patterns kind of that you were seeing for specifically San Francisco, but patterns that you're recognizing from all the different studies and stuff that you work on, are people in impoverished areas happy to get these new trees? And do they understand the monetary value of mature trees? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to speak for all people in impoverished areas. Uh, I would say that I have definitely talked to some who recognize the value of trees in their neighborhood and um, and uh, recognize maybe not the monetary value, but the different values that, that trees provide. Um, 
I'm just, I'm, I'm very hesitant in answering this question because I always, when, when it comes to these kind of issues, I always want to go straight to the communities themselves and, have, and amplify their voice. Um, and so I don't, I'm not used to speaking on behalf of them, but I will say that this is an issue that communities themselves have recognized, impoverished communities themselves have recognized and are working on. Love it. Any other questions, Josh, you're seeing no more that you see? No, there's no. I think there's some other, cool. There, I, I wouldn't. All right. Want to check out some of the links that are in the um, in the chat because there are a lot of really awesome resources in there. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about it. Cool. Well, I know we're a bit over time by three minutes here. We want to make sure you guys can enjoy the rest of your weekend. So thank you to all of the panelists who attended, as well as all of you attendees listening in, and hopefully those of you that are listening through the recording. The next webinar is going to be on Sunday, October fourth at eleven a.m. Pacific time, and it's called Burrs birds, bees, and city trees, and will feature the distinguished professor of wildlife ecology from Clemson University, Dr. J. Drew Lanham. Uh, professor Lanham is a published author who has appeared on NPR to discuss birding while black, as well as a Spotify podcast, This Is Love. It will also feature award-winning documentary filmmaker Judy Irving, the director of The Wild Parrots of Telegraph here. I love that film. And the registration to this link is in the chat box. So feel free to open up your chat box there and register right now. And we'll leave it open for a few moments to give you a chance to click through. Again, thank you all for the honor, especially you panelists. Great job with your presentations and answers. And thank you again to our host, Josh Clip, for making sure that we could have a safe space for this type of discussion. So thank you, everybody. 